Good morning and welcome to Rose Red Homestead, where today we are going to deal with a troubling issue, and that is liquid loss when we can. Now, this goes directly to food security and emergency preparedness because many of us are doing a lot of canning in order to prepare for the very uncertain times that are surrounding us right now and perhaps more to come. One of the things that happens during canning is that um, there is liquid loss from the jars. And I have some examples from my own uh, supply from our food storage that shows liquid loss in jars. Now, you may wonder why I'm not calling it siphoning. Well, that, I call it siphoning most of the time. Siphoning has become sort of a catchphrase that all types of water loss are dumped into that word siphoning. And oh, we think, well, did we have siphoning? Did we not have siphoning? But in reality, there are five different things that can happen that cause water loss or liquid loss in jars when we can. So we're going to go through it. Now, some of you will remember, and also this is the reason why we are doing this video, is that a few videos ago, we did a video on preparing chicken for the freezer. And as part of that video, we processed uh, three chicken carcasses along with some aromatics and turned it into broth. And then we canned some broth and we were able to capture on camera uh, some pretty explosive liquid loss from the jars of our broth. I'm going to reinsert that clip, uh, uh, that clip of that little incident a little bit later in this video so you can all see it. But it was not siphoning. So let's get into it and we'll talk about each of these individually. Um, first of all, one of, the, one of the major ways that liquid is lost in a jar is through actual scientific siphoning. Now, what is siphoning? Well, if you've ever siphoned gas from a car or liquid or whatever, you have to be on the outside of the container. The hose has to come um, from the uh, liquid to a lower level, and then you have to either suck or have some kind of a um, bulb that you can squeeze that will create a suction to get it started to draw the liquid out and then down into whatever container you want it to be in. So that is siphoning. It is, it is an action external to the jars or to, the, um, to what's happening inside the jars. So what causes siphoning? Now, when we did that video and showed that part of the liquid loss, explosive liquid loss, practically everyone who offered an explanation said, well, it was because of headspace. That siphoning occurs because of headspace, and it does not. That is not the type of liquid loss that is caused from headspace. Improper headspace will produce siphoning. And, um, and here is, is what happens because of that. So let's take, for instance, and by the way, I have the rings on these jars, and some of you know that the USDA says that we should take the rings off. The reason being that if this is going to break seal, we don't want a, a band clamping down on it. Well, I don't really have a good place to put my bands, so I just loosen them to where they're very loose so that if it's going to break seal, it's going to break seal. I don't double stack jars, so that's not an issue. So what happens with improper headspace, and there's a little bit of siphoning right here, and we'll talk about the reason uh, this was not because of improper headspace. We'll get to that in just a minute. But what happens is food expands, it swells when it gets hot, and therefore it's taking up more space. And if, you, if we have not left enough head space, then what is happening is that liquid will be pushed out of the top. So siphoning is drawing out or pushing out from the inside of jars. And so improper head space doesn't leave enough room for food to expand sometimes, which causes siphoning. All right, so the other thing that causes siphoning is uh, fluctuation in the pressure. And uh, for those of us that pressure can, some of us use weighted gauge canners, I do. Others of us use dial canners. Well, mine is actually a dial canner with the weighted gauge. But um, some canners have only the weighted gauge without the dial. And so we need to remember that what needs to happen is the pressure needs to build up gradually. It needs to be maintained. 
and then it needs to cool down naturally. So this curve is really smooth in terms of pressure. But if we heat it up way fast and then have to bring the, it down from where it was and it fluctuates while we're trying to, to fool around to get it right, and then we do something in the cool down time that jiggles. Uh, uh, Presto says that even if we jiggle that weighted gauge while it's cooling down, that can cause siphoning. And so we want to think of pressure as a smooth curve. And sometimes it's unavoidable. But one of the things that Presto says um, in its research on its own product, we need to have a constant jiggle if we are using a weighted gauge canner that it shouldn't go If it's going that fast, it is struggling to get excess pressure out of the canner. And so that is a fluctuation of pressure that may cause uh, some siphoning. Rather, it should just tell us with that it's having a, an easy time releasing the pressure, the excess pressure inside. And so a slow, even uh, jiggle is what we are shooting for. And sometimes it's really tough to find that sweet spot in our heat system in order to get there. I had an electric um, stove once that I just struggled and struggled to find the right spot and never could. Um, and so I had to be there close by so that I could turn it up, turn it down, turn it up, turn it down. It was a pain in the neck. Okay, so uh, the other thing is, in terms of the pressure fluctuation, that we always, always, no excuses ever, we must let the pressure, after the heat goes off, back away from that canner and just let it come down to normal pressure on its own. And sometimes, in my early years of canning, I used to, and I, I hesitate to even tell this to you, but I used to take my canner and, and put it under cold water to get the pressure down. And um, that is not only dangerous, but it also um, lends itself to a, a lot of siphoning. So don't do that. Don't artificially cool down. I have one canner that takes over an hour to cool down. My big Presto canner, my 23 quart canner, it cools down in 40 minutes and then I can open it. So we just need to let our canners call the shots on that one. Okay, the second one is a temperature differential. And what I mean by that is that inside that canner, and by the way, this one refers to pressure canning on only. These two, three, and four refer to both pressure canning and water bath canning. And number five refers to water bath canning only. So, Temperature differential affects both pressure canning and water bath canning. And what I mean by that is that um, when the jars that are hot inside the canner, and remember, those jars in a pressure canner have been up to 240 degrees in order to kill botulism. And so, as, and, and temperature and pressure are interlinked. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other one goes down. And so when we say temperature differential, it has a little bit to do with pressure fluctuation as well. But the temperature on the inside is, has, is cooling down from 240 degrees. And even when the pressure gets to zero, that does not mean that the inside of the canner is at room temperature. It is still very, very hot inside that canner. And so if we open the lid too fast, that can cause um, the explosive type of water loss that we saw. We had a few people comment on that video that we showed that explosive water loss to say, well, I'm never going to can because I don't want to have to deal with that. That explosive siphoning doesn't happen very often. It is, I don't even recall that it has ever happened to me until I started canning broth in my uh, electric canner. And that's the only time that it has happened to me, and that is just in the last couple of years. And so I've spent a lifetime of canning where that never occurred that I knew of. So um, what happens here, we can call it an improper cool down, but we can still do everything right. 
I did everything right on that canner uh, when that occurred, and I'm going to show you that clip in just a moment. We let it cool down to zero. We left it in there without touching it for about 10 minutes. And then when I opened the lid, boom, that's when it happened. That's when that, that liquid shot out of the jar. Here is that clip. We are ready to finish up our adventure with that chicken today. So the canner is finished. It has cooled down. It's been sitting here for about five minutes. Uh-oh, we're getting some siphoning. Jim, do you want to come and see if you can get a close-up of this without getting burned? Wow. Isn't that something? It's been sitting here for 10 minutes, and so it shouldn't be doing that. All right, I'm going to put the lid back on that. So here's what I did the next time I canned broth, which was just a few days after that event. I was aware this time of what that temperature differential had caused before, and I did not want to repeat. And so I let the, the pressure go down to zero. I waited an extra 10 minutes. And then all I did was just unscrew the lid. And that's all. And I heard it going on inside the, the canner. It wasn't very much, but it was a little bit. And so I put the lid back, screwed it back in place so that it was locked down tight and gave it another 10 minutes. And then this time I twisted the lid. I didn't lift it. I just twisted it. It was still on the canner. And I listened and there was none, none of that shh going on, that sound that was obviously liquid being shot from the jars. <laughs> And so then I put a, um, a wooden spoon. I lifted the lid only enough to put a wooden spoon under it so the lid was only open about this much. And I left it another five minutes and then I opened the lid. And so once again, this smooth curve that we talk about also pertains to the temperature. So we need to be sure that our jars are ready to be reintroduced to the real world and not under pressure, under that high pressure. Because what happens was, what, what caused that was that the liquid inside the jars, um, it, it boils when, is it, when it's at 240 degrees or higher, between 240 and 250 generally. Then it's created a different atmospheric situation to where the stuff, the food in the jars just boils like it would on a pot on the stove but it's under a great deal of pressure. When we release that pressure, then what happens is those atmospheric conditions have changed. And so when it was boiling at 250 like this, when the atmospheric conditions change as it cools down, then it starts to super boil. It's already way too hot. It's still over 212 degrees sea level. Our boiling temperature here is 203, so it fluctuates according to elevation, but that's a different discussion. And so it super boils. And so when the temperature changed dramatically, that also upset the equilibrium inside the jars, and it super boiled so high that it sent liquid out. And so we just, and that never occurs when I can anything but broth, because I had canned um, enchilada sauce, no siphoning whatsoever. In fact, with that enchilada sauce, I let it, um, the canner rest for 10 minutes, opened the lid, and took the jars out. Zero siphoning. But the next time I did broth, same thing. So now I know, and I'm aware of when I can broth, I need to be extra, extra careful to watch out for this temperature differential. Okay, so number three is hidden air. Foods have air as part of their mass, that air is trapped inside the food, particularly fruits, particularly peaches. And that's what happened here because um, I raw pack peaches. Um, the USDA says that raw packing peaches is just fine, but Presto and um, other organizations do not recommend doing raw pack with fruits because fruits have a lot of air embedded in them. And they say at least heat the peaches up before you put them in the jar. So I have started doing that and um, it's, it's far less liquid loss. And the liquid loss isn't because liquid shoots out of the jar or dribbles down the side. 
Mostly when siphoning occurs because of headspace or pressure fluctuation, it's just that um, water or the liquid is pushed out and then dribbles down the side. It's not that explosive thing that I showed in the clip. And here, no liquid escaped. What happened was, as the peaches cooked in the canner, it, they gave up their air. Well, that air moved to the top of the jar. And so that's what this air is. That airspace is not liquid loss necessarily, but it's the lowering of the liquid level because the, it, it was air that was then um, taking up its space at the top and pushing the liquid down. So that's what happens here. I still will raw pack. It's just so much easier to me for me. But um, it's a personal choice. If, if you are concerned about that much of a liquid loss, which I am not, then you may want to heat your fruit ahead of time. Then the other thing is that air can be hiding down in the food in any one of these jars. Well, not this one. But uh, that's why we want to debubble. Because if there's a pocket of air that's being trapped by the food that we don't release and have it bubble to the top, then it is going to bubble to the top during canning, and there will be the airspace will increase at the top. Now, what happens with that is that some of the food may be up above the liquid level, and we've got peaches here that are above the liquid level. And when that happens, the peaches might turn a little bit dark, the food might turn a little bit dark, but that does not interfere with the taste or the uh, safety of the food at all. So, um, hidden air. So it's really important to uh, debubble and then to do hot pack uh, food when you possibly can. Now the, the other thing is that um, this is a jar of beans. This is my triple mix beans. The liquid is here. You may see that. So these beans are dry and darker. What happens when we can beans? The reason that we want to follow USDA guidelines when canning beans is that um, we want the beans to be completely hydrated. That's why we soak them overnight and then we cook them for 30 minutes on the stove before we can them so that we can get them filled with as much water as possible so that they are completely hydrated. But even with that, they can absorb more moisture when they are in the canning process. And so the beans have swelled and absorbed more of this liquid, leaving these high and dry. Now, any time we go through any liquid loss, um, like we did in every one of these jars, um, so long as the jar seals and that there's about 50% water left in the jar, we're okay. It's safe to go forward. All right, then there are lid issues. And um, I'm not sure I've ever had liquid loss because of this, but perhaps I have. I don't know. I'm really careful about these things. If we use already previously used lids, they may not seal appropriately and allow liquid to boil out. Unclean rims, when we wipe the rims, and if there's any um, grease or oil in the food that you are canning, like with meats, then you want to use vinegar to dampen a paper towel to wipe because vinegar cuts that um, cuts the oil and provides for a better seal. Now, when we have liquid loss, that liquid goes external to the jars and brushes across the rims on its way out, it can leave a greasy residue on the rim that can prevent sealing from occurring. Usually, sealing occurs in spite of all that. Now, whenever I have siphoning occur in anything that has that grease or oil in it and the jars seal, I just mark those to watch because it could be that that seal will not last as long as um, it otherwise would have. So we just need to be really careful. And also that our bands are not on tight enough. So what is finger tight? Well, so I put my lid on and I have my band and I'm now ready to put this jar in the canner. I will screw this band on and then with my fingers, not with the palm of my hand, but just with my fingers, I will screw this down tight. It needs to be firm, 
but we don't want it cranked down so tight that steam cannot get out of the jar because the contents inside the canner are going to be boiling and they're going to be venting steam and we want that steam vented and so it has to be loose enough so that um, it will come out. And so practice with finger tight, just with your fingers. Some of us, I have big hands for a woman. I have man hands. And so I can do it just fine. If you have small hands or if you have a weakness in your hands like I'm beginning to start to feel, I will sometimes use the heel of my hand just a little bit. But I know better than to crank it down really hard. Okay, so those are the lid issues. Then with water bath canning, um, especially with fruits with syrup, um, especially with apple pie filling, uh, when we water bath can and the water is not sitting about two inches above the jar, then that can also cause siphoning. So that's an issue we need to be um, aware of. The big thing to remember here is, in terms of safety, is we want the canning process, the time that the jars are in the canner, to have smooth curves. Um, slow rise in temperature, leveling off, slow cooling of the temperature. Same with pressure. Build the pressure smoothly, let it hold and then let it cool down naturally. Think of a smooth curve. And make adjustments, like I've had to make adjustments. This was some of my broth. Look how much liquid I lost because of that explosive uh, liquid loss, that temperature differential. And um, so that's, gosh, that's almost a cup of liquid right there that I lost because of that. But I diagnosed the problem, worked with it, and now I've got it to where I know what to do. So we just need to be sure at the, the, um, at the final end of our canning, we need to reintroduce the jars to the atmospheric pressures and temperatures that are normal for us in our kitchens. And if that takes a little more resting time in order to um, accomplish, then that's what we, we, we do. However, a couple of people said that, oh, well, I just leave my canner overnight and let it cool down overnight. Please don't do that that is dangerous to do because of certain organisms that can be in there that love the heat that is still in there over a long period of time. We want to get the jars out of the canner as soon as safely possible so that they can cool down to at our regular temperature and atmospheric pressures in our kitchens. Don't leave them in your canner overnight. Even if the pressure is all the way down, don't do it. That is not a safe strategy. There's one more thing and I'm going to use my red pen to write number six. So sometimes, even when we do everything right, we still get water loss in our jars. And I'll tell you, it's just the gremlins. Now, <laughs> that's kind of a family joke. Uh, Jim and I, sometimes we come up against something that, well, I didn't do it. And he'll say, oh, I didn't do it. How did that happen? I don't know. I didn't do it. And so we have just agreed to say that the gremlins did it. And uh, that solves a lot of problems for us that we can um, not be accusing each other, even though neither one of us can remember having done whatever it was. So sometimes it's just those darn gremlins. So it's nothing to be concerned about. It happens to everybody. You can see that it has happened to me many times. The thing to remember is if, the half, if half of the liquid is still in the jar and the jar sealed, you are good to go. Your food is just fine. So I hope this discussion has been helpful for you and that it will ease your mind somewhat on um, liquid loss and particularly those of you that have said, I'm never gonna do canning because of that siphoning that shot the water out of the jars. Well, that is so rare, so rare. And now that we know what causes it, we can act accordingly and we can um, use preventive measures. 
So thank you so much for being with us. And I hope you share this video with anyone who is worried about what most all of us just call lump everything in together called siphoning, but what in actuality is really liquid loss caused by the, these five different things. Thanks for being with us and we will see you very soon for another video.